CTW Automation here and we're continuing our series of building test sequences for your LA linear actuator and even your EMA that we have converted to probe. That way we can all get on the same page for building a test, the sequence to use, and the commands. Now this is going to be an expansion of the first video we did so we're going to start with the same test we finished with then we're going to keep adding commands and building on this so you can get more and more understanding and more and more out of your actuator in the software. So same test we had before where we as always we always turn the axis on and then we turn it off we always start record and then we stop we do a push gain, a performance gain, and a pop gain which is the nice soft ones and somewhere in the middle we do these test speeds. So in this example we're going to expand, we're going to add some more commands that should make your life a little easier, make everything go quicker and get you more information in your data. So we've done the enable access, we moved to position and then we did our warm up and we moved where we're going to start to test from start recording. So what we're going to add is a uh, the command we're going to set the raw diameter if I can find it. It's always tricky here. Set raw diameter. So with this command we always put it somewhere in the start recording. So this allows you to set the shaft diameter. Now that is used when we do a rod force test if it has a if the software is given a shaft diameter then it can be used to calculate the pressure based on the rod force and that's what this does so we're going to set it at a half inch uh, if you have multiple different dampers you use with different shafts you can actually make your test based on the shaft diameter so that way you don't have to remember to change it every time it's already done so we're going to set the rod diameter and then we're going to do edit fields edit fields is another command that gives you the ability I'm going to slide it right up in there gives you the ability to add notes to your test so as this was test sequence was running it do the warm up start recording hit that sh uh, set rod diameter you wouldn't even notice that and then you all of a sudden you would get a pop up on the screen to add notes now this tells the test to allow you to do that but the notes actually get added in this start recording button here. That way we can save the notes with this test. And that way they're always embedded. So if you have a particular customer or you're a manufacturer and you have your notes this way everybody that uses this test in your facility on all your machines already has those notes in it. Now the default notes section is obviously pretty plain. Just a, just a wide open box. But if you do open field set as you see you can load fields. These are notes pages. Now you can build any sequence in any way possible your notes pages using five commands that we allow you to have. So basically this command is multi-line where you can just keep typing and typing until you're you're tired of typing. You have a single line then you have a value option where you can actually type in some value. You have a drop-down so if you have all your shims and you already know what they are, you can make drop-down lists so that somebody just comes down and chooses which one they want. And there's even a checkbox. I have no idea how that would work in anybody's thing, but maybe you say, did you do this? Did you turn the coffee machine off? I don't know, but you check it. So these are the notes. Now, this, isn't, this gives you an idea of the different things you can do. Now I'll open this one, Fields Rorg example where I've actually gone ahead and created what we all remember as what was in the Rorig notes, shock name, ID, vehicle, and you can fill these out. Now you can, like I said, you can set these up and name them any way you want, but this is how you get them into your test. You load them and start recording, and then you use the edit fields button. The screen will come up and you get to add those. So once we do the raw diameter, edit fields, then we're gonna do set file name. It's going to drag that up there again right after edit fields and this is typically a good order you want to follow. So shaft diameter, edit your fields and then give it a name. So while your test is running these things are just going to happen. You're going to get your fields, your notes, or when you're done with that you'll get a save as screen and you can do a few things with this that are very handy. You can tell it where to save the information. 
Uh, default is always documents, CTW automation, data, but you can create folders and tell it save everything in the video data. You can even give it a name. I'm going to pre-name it Superman so that you can imagine when you get to the Save As screen, Superman will show up and maybe I just type in A or Superman 1. Or maybe you call the suggested file name TTX and you're just saying right front, you know, minus 2 plus 3 A. But you can at least type in a file name that you know is going to be in all your files and that way it gets you a little bit ahead of the game, a little bit further down the road. So that way you already have in your data, you're going to have a raw diameter, you get your notes, and your name. Now, in the past, we did this push gain, and before that, we're going to add another command that I hope everybody uses, rod force. And in the next video, we're going to show you the multipoint. But the rod force, and we're going to push that guy up here. The rod force is basically a way to measure any internal pressure trying to push that shaft out of the damper so that we can measure it and then remove it from the data because ultimately it's just a spring force. It's just a constant force that's being added and there's no reason to have it in your dynamic data, your force versus velocity data or displacement because in the real world it, uh, you remove it when you set ride heights and you do that on your car or your motorcycle or your bicycle. You set your ride heights based on that lifting spring rate and you take it out so that you only have the dynamic effect. So we're going to take the static effect of the shock trying to push that rod back out. Now it's important to use because with in conjunction with the set rod diameter we can generate a calculated pressure and you can use that to make sure you've pressured your shock properly. So the way the rod force works is we tell it a position to start and we can say anything, anything low, um, a half inch say. So the first thing it'll do, the actuator will move to a half an inch above zero. That's that, the, the home. That's where the actuator rests at. And we can say we're going to test at two inches because we're testing, uh, trying to be the middle of the damper uh, test range. Position reversal, we're going to go to 2.5 and pause for two seconds. So hopefully everybody understands how this rod force works. Um, so it's going to start at a half and it's going to move to two inches. And it's going to pause for this amount of time, two seconds. And it's going to take a force reading. Then it's going to move up to two and a half inches, then come back to two inches and pause again. For two seconds, take another force reading. It's going to add those two forces together, divide by two and call that the rod force. That's how much static spring is in that damper just trying to push the shaft out. So it's going to write that down. This half inch per second, that's how fast it will move between all these positions. And the very most important thing to remember is if you have very little bleed, the settle time would want to be higher and the speed to move would want to be slower because any time a, a low bleed or a no bleed damper moves, it's building up huge amounts of internal pressure. When you stop and try to just get a load cell reading, that pressure can't equalize. So the longer you settle, the slower you go, the better that is. Conversely, with a high bleed damper, you only may have to settle for a second and you can move a little faster to get your test going even quicker. So those are the things you have to keep in mind. This, uh, again, this two inch position test in the reversal, on a crank dyno, if you all remember, it would stop at mid stroke on one side, then it would uh, rotate up and back down to the other side. This reversal is trying to do the same thing. It's trying to go up to get the seals to reverse. So you want to go up some amount, get the seals to reverse, get any friction going the other way so that when you pause and do your measurement, you get the damper basically moving in both directions. So that's your rod force. Now after the rod force, we want to make sure the actuator goes to where we want to begin our tests. So I'm going to take this one and move it down to right after rod force. Now I was able to move it because after the timed warm up, regardless of where the damper is at that point, this rod force is going to set where it's gonna start. So it's gonna end time warm up and it's gonna go to this half an inch per second. And then the rod force is gonna happen when the rod force is done, we want to say, take this to uh, one inch position so we can start our actual test. 
Now this is just arbitrary, that's just a number I'm using. You get to use whatever you want. But basically your test will run from this position in the uh, positive direction. So if you have a two inch stroke, it's gonna run from one to three and back in a sine wave, up and down, up and down from one to three. If you have a four inch stroke, it's gonna run from one to five. So everything starts from, from this position and goes up. No offset, so that's very important. So now we've gotten that ready, we go to our old uh, our push gains, our performance gains. We talked about that a little bit in the last video. This is basically how hard we tell the linear actuator to move and how hard it follows the command. Now these are all PID loops. These all tell the actuator to do uh, position, velocity, acceleration, and how hard to maintain all of those things. If you get too extreme, then you will start to have your actuator squeal and it will start talking to you and I don't think anybody in the offices adjoining will be happy. So we want to use these numbers within a reason. Work with us and we will help you get uh, what you, whatever you want to do for performance. If you're not getting what you think you need, we will help you tune these. But the big ones would be this KP and this K-Pause. This KP can go from 1,000 up to 1,400, 1,600. This K-Pause can go from 100 up to 175. In this range is where you want to be. So we have this move to position. Now we're ready to actually do our test velocities. Uh, so we throw in a push gain and we have two test speeds. Now we'll just add two more just for fun. Just so we can continue learning together how to make this work. And you can see again, you have to wait for that bar. And I'm going to actually add another one and drag this up. That bar is where it's going to drop. So we ran at 5, we ran at 10. We're going to run here at, let's say, 15 and 15. We'll run 20 and 20 in extension. That's what those speeds are. Positive is compression and negative is extension. So we're going to stay, you're going to do this one. Uh, the compression to 40, but we are going to maintain the extension at 20. Now these are uh, variable speed waveforms, very, very useful on motorcycle and bicycle dampers where you want to, you can only ever run so fast on extension, but compression keeps getting faster and faster. Um, so they better match the real world. So this test will actually uh, the compression will actually go up to 40 while the rebound stops at 20 when we get to that point. And like we've done in the past, we only need to have two cycles. So run two cycles, choose the second one. Run two cycles, choose the second one, and we'll do this one. And we have five speeds. They're all sine waves. And... Uh, those are good to go. Now the other thing we can add to this test that many of you use is a PVP. So you no longer have to create individual PVP tests, individual CVP tests. If you have any series of speeds, if you do create PVP command, you can just add it to your test and all of a sudden you've taken a, uh, a multi-speed run and created a PVP from it. So you get your PVP, you come over here and you have three real options. This one, uh, this one is, I just never use this because it it's too, uh, doesn't repeat well enough at zero displacement. So if you use centered at zero displacement or peak velocity or peak force, it's very important. You need to understand what each of them mean. Centered at zero displacement using a window. So basically it's gonna take an average within this window at zero for both the force at compression and extension. It's very good, it's very repeatable, it's what most manufacturers use. Now if you were to choose peak velocity, it's just going to find the force at whatever the peak velocity is. And it's just gonna grab one point. Not a lot of averaging, uh, actually no averaging, because it's really just gonna do uh, whatever the peak velocity is gonna find that force. And then peak force can be very tricky as well because peak force, in a perfect damper, peak force happens at peak velocity. However, as uh, anybody working with bicycles, motorcycles, 
that doesn't always happen. You don't always have peak force. Sometimes peak force happens beyond mid-stroke. It happens further in the compression stroke because, well, you have a spring effect and you have a large gas chamber and maybe, uh, maybe there's something else, that another stage is going on inside. So peak force happens not at peak velocity, but it happens at a different spot. And you have to understand, I do take calls on this, like why is this PVP not look right? And I always come back to finding out that they're doing a calculation based on peak force and their damper is not making peak force at peak velocity. And it's a learning experience, but you need to know. If you, if you don't know what to do, just do centered at zero displacement. So it will take all this data and create a PVP when we're all done. So that's what that does. Pop gains, we always want to do a push followed by a pop. We always want to do a start recording, end with a stop recording. We always want to take the actuator back home when we're done, and then we turn it off. All of those things create the next test and allow you to do PVPs now, allow you to do add a rod force, get your set name, edit fields, and set rod diameters. Now you know how to use even more test ability. In the next video, we're going to add in the uh, multi-point gas test, which gives you uh, even the next step of a rod force. So let's see. This test, although not exactly the test I created, but this is what we can go through. So you can actually see maybe what this machine does. You know, we, we, we do all of this, and, it's, and you wonder, okay, what, what is this going to look like? So, turn the axis on. And this, you can find this in our new manual. I've gone through and tried to do everything in the new manual, word by word, page by page, picture by picture, so that you can, you can do it and read it slower. But we all know nobody looks at the manual, so that's why we're making videos. So, you turn the axis on and you move to position. I moved up a half an inch. And then I said, do a timed warm up. So you can see from a half an inch, it did the time warm up, plus and minus one inch amplitude, two inch stroke, so it went from a half to two and a half, up and down and up and down for five seconds, and it ran at a speed of 10 inches per second. Great. Finish the time warm up, and this is the multi-point gas test, and you can see, it looks a little different than the single spike. You can see we did five steps up, five steps down, and I'll actually show this in the next video. When that was done, I moved to a position of a half, and I ran test speeds. So we have all these test speeds, and this is what those test speeds may look like. And this is the displacement sensor. So this is the displacement. So you can see we ran one speed, another speed, another speed. You can see they're getting smaller and smaller. That means it's getting faster and faster. So it ran all those speeds. It created the PVP. And we moved it back home. We turned it off. So that's what an actual test would look like if you could see the displacement. So gives you an idea. So there is your second step your second video course in doing the linear actuator test sequence and we're going to make another one and we're going to go through the rod force multi-point so there you go see you later